Hello and welcome. Today is our sixth and final free Vision Tune-Up Tuesday. Today is Tuesday, May 12th, 2020. And I just want to start by saying how it's been so awesome to be offering these free Vision Tune-Up Tuesdays over the past five weeks. And really one of the main things I've been aiming to convey in these classes is the importance of regularity and frequency and consistency when it comes to working with your vision and the Bates method. You know, this kind of stuff really works when we get regular with it, when we do it on a weekly basis or maybe even more, more frequently. And so appreciate those of you who have been tuning in live with me and also watching the replays. There's been you know, over like 100 people each live class and thousands of people are watching the replays. So I've just been getting some really good feedback about these classes. Um, not only are they kind of relaxing and enjoyable, but they've actually been yielding some good results in people. People getting clear flashes, people having improvements in a very short period of time, which really proves to you that it doesn't take that much to get these improvements. And so in today's class, I really wanted to just kind of do a little bit of a review and kind of guide you through another vision routine together today to really be aiming at cultivating these clear flashes. So these are these moments of better vision without glasses or contacts. And these are little signs that you're having improvements. They're like little previews of where you're headed if you do stick with this. And you're getting closer and closer to this normal sight, this clearer vision and less blur. Now, <clears throat> before we dive in, I did just want to let you know that if you have been getting some benefits from these classes and enjoying them, uh, there are two really exciting opportunities coming up to go even deeper with this. Uh, first, this weekend, I'm doing my first two-day virtual vision retreat on Saturday, May 16th and Sunday, May 17th, where we're going to be meeting three times a day for these vision classes from the morning through the evening with some breaks in between. Uh, to take a break from the screen and everything. Uh, but this is going to be more of an immersion style where, as opposed to each week, it's actually two days in a row, just really a really concentrated experience with this stuff. After that, I'm starting my next six-month vision improvement program, which is an online group course that's going to go from this June to November of 2020. So as opposed to the retreat, which is a more kind of crash course, like immersion style, concentrated over one weekend, we get to space it out and spread it out over half of a year. And we get to meet up once a month for group vision classes like these vision tune-ups. Plus you get one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions with me each month throughout the six month program. So that's really like the best thing about it is really to get this individualized one-on-one -on -one coaching interaction. So I'm gonna be sharing more information about that on my website, integraleyesight.com. You can get information about both the retreat and the six month program. If one or both of those um, sounds like it would be a good opportunity for you to go even deeper into this work than we already have been in the past five months. I'm sorry, five weeks. Sorry, the quarantine is kind of messing with time <laughs> perception lately. So what I want to do is kind of go back to where we started, which was relaxation. Okay, so what I want to do is just kind of give you an, an experience today, an excuse to get some of these good vision practices under your belt um, to, to count towards getting these clear flashes. And at any point, you can type into the group chat. Um, if you have a clear flash or if you have a moment of better vision, not only what I'd like to know, but other people here would probably like to know because it inspires everybody and we can all elevate each other. That's really the cool thing about these, these live streams is that we're here together in real time. So to start off with some relaxation, we are going to do some just some general stretching and breathing to kind of get into the body, get into the breath and prepare for a little mini vision routine to get today together. So if you want to, first of all, remove any kind of lenses. So if you've got glasses on or contacts, you can actually remove them and perform this practice with me with the naked eye because we want to be really sensitive to any changes that happen in our vision as we go through. If you have your glasses or contacts on, you might not notice when you get a clear flash because they kind of fix the vision at a certain level. 
So when you take them off and now maybe your vision's blurrier, now it's time to try some different techniques and practices that might make a change so it's less blurry and a little more clear or a lot more clear. So however you want to stretch, I want you to just kind of start to find some movement in your body. Maybe you kind of pretend like you're just waking up in the morning, you're getting out of bed, you're just doing some big stretches, and maybe this already begins this desire to want to yawn along with it. <sighs> So whatever feels good, just kind of some fluid stretches. I'm just kind of focusing on my upper body right now. So I'm just kind of doing some arms, some neck rolls, you know, just kind of loosening up my neck and shoulders, maybe some shoulder rolls or shrugs or tensing and releasing. And we want, we want to start this uh, breathing process with the yawning. And it's a very natural breath. Every animal pretty much on the planet does it. And so we want to get into that rhythm of a couple yawns in a row. <sighs> Sometimes you have to fake it till you make it. You know, that wasn't a real one. <sighs> but I'm just inhaling and I'm exhaling and making that yawning sound. And sometimes just hearing that sound actually makes a real yawn start to come up. But sometimes it takes five or ten tries to really tap into that really big, deep, natural yawn. <sighs> and you know what? Maybe it never comes when you're trying to force it. But maybe at some point throughout the rest of our class today, you might feel this desire to want to take a big yawn. And I don't want you to suppress that. I want you to let it up, let it out, and take a big yawn. Really what we're doing is we're lubricating the eyes because it really gets the lacrimal glands to produce some more tears to lubricate the surface of the eyes. And we can continue doing a couple more uh, breathing practices. Um, in the first week, we talked about sighing, which is kind of similar to the sound I was making with the yawn. Um, but you can play around with the sigh of just inhaling. And then, uh, so I really like this descending tone. It's a comforting sound for me to hear. And I can do it with my mouth open or closed. And with my mouth closed, it's almost like I'm feeling the vibrations of my teeth touching each other, kind of going through the jaw into the skull. And it actually seems to, to bring some softness into my eye muscles when I feel that vibration kind of going through my head there. Mm. Nice. So we're just beginning to settle in and kind of calm down the nervous system, right? Because all vision problems are nervous problems. And when we're in this kind of tense, sympathetic nervous system state, our vision might not be functioning in a relaxed way. So we want to see if we can activate more of this parasympathetic response with these relaxing breaths. So we're going to do two more uh, little breathing practices before we move into uh, some more movement review from our second week. So I want to do um, some one to two ratio breathing. So what this means is that your inhale is going to be the one and then the exhale is going to be the two. And that can mean one second in, two seconds out, or it could be two seconds in, four seconds out. So essentially your exhale is twice as long as your inhale. But you get to choose the length. So just do whatever feels comfortable. I'm going to start with a, a very short one. So just one in and two out. So one in, two out. And maybe we can extend that. So maybe two in and four out. Two in and four out. So you can either stay there or maybe you can extend it to three in and six out. So three in and six out. Nice. So you can play with it and extend it and, and get it to be kind of drawing out a little bit longer and longer. But you just want to always make sure you're not straining, right? Because the goal here is relaxation. So it's okay if it's shorter, you know, this is, might take some practice to extend it. But generally, when we have this longer exhale, it tends to be a little bit more relaxing. 
But on the if we reverse that, instead of doing one in, two out, we can now do two in, one out. And there's a specific way I want you to do this because for the one second in at first, it's gonna be your belly expanding. So you're breathing into the, the lower part. So you're expanding the belly. And then the second second is up in the lungs and the chest. So it's like you're inhaling in the belly first and then the chest. And then the exhale is just like the one second, just like, just let it go. You don't have to think about the chest or the belly, you just let it go. So I'll guide you through this. You can join me as well. So we're going to inhale belly, chest, let it go. Belly, chest, let it go. And you can have your hands on each spot if you want. So you can have your hand on your belly, chest, let it go. Belly, chest, let it go. And you can do nose or mouth. You can kind of play around with it. But when you get into the rhythm of this, it can be very, very relaxing and can sometimes make a change in your vision because we're really oxygenating the eyes here. So I want to do a couple more with you. And then I want to actually do a breath hold. So we're going to do two in, one out, two in, one out several times. And then on the out, we're going to palm our eyes as we hold our breath in a relaxed way. You don't want to be all tight and tense, but you're just going to hold, you're going to exhale and hold as you palm your eyes. Now only hold for as long as is comfortable. Whenever you need to, you start to breathe in again. And we're actually going to hold at the top of the inhale after that too. So I'll guide you through it. Just make sure you're in a comfortable place where you're seated and you can rest your elbows on something as you palm so you can be nice and comfortable. So I'm going to get my palming board. I have it set up here ready for when it's time to hold our breath. But I'm going to have my hands on my belly and my chest as we go belly, chest, exhale. Belly, chest, exhale. Belly, chest, exhale. Your eyes can be open or closed. Belly, chest, let it go. Belly, chest, and release. A couple more times. Belly, chest, exhale. Belly, chest, exhale. Let's do one more time. Big breath in. Belly, chest, and big exhale. And then you hold your breath out <laughs> as you palm. And you're just going to let the breath stay out as long as it's comfortable. Just notice any feelings or sensations. Maybe tune into your eyes. Maybe invite your eyes to move around, even though you're palming. You don't want to stare. So even though you're not breathing right now, your eyes can still move around freely and easily. But whenever you need to, you just slowly start to take some more air in. But we're going to hold the inhale as well. So before you let it go, just close and hold. Continue palming. Continue tuning into the eyes. Or maybe another part of your body is calling your attention. It's all connected. And then you let that go. And just let your breath return to normal. And we're going to slowly transition back out of palming. We're going to do a little bit more palming later. But for now, you're going to let your eyes readjust to the light before you open them. We're not going to open them normally. We're going to do our little eye pictures. We're going to do some flashing where you just open your eyelids for a fraction of a second and then they're already closed again. So I call it a reverse blink because it's sort of the opposite of how fast a blink happens. This is an opening really fast. And you want to take a picture of different things. You don't want to take a picture of the same thing every time. You want to look maybe at a different distance, flash open and close. Maybe hold up something close like your hand or if you have a watch on or something like that. You flash open on a near object. So you want to try it on a couple different things. 
and now you're probably readjusted to the light now and you can just kind of blink your eyes open and have them stay open normally. And immediately after doing some breathing and some palming and relaxing, you wanna notice, is there already a tangible change in how you're seeing or how you're feeling? Maybe there's already some clear flashes happening in the group, you know, just from doing one simple little relaxation routine there. So that's gonna lead us into a little review of more of our more active practices like some of this movement. So some swinging, and we're going to do some a little bit of brain balancing here because this is a combination of some movement and some fusion that we did last week. So if you want to join me in a standing position, that would be ideal. You can stay seated if you'd like, but we're going to get into our long swing. But before we do that, we're going to connect in with our mental swing first. So first, I want you to just sit or stand still with your eyes closed. And I want you to imagine a pendulum swinging in your mind. So it's this object swinging to the left, swinging to the right, through the midline, back and forth. You get to choose what the pendulum is. Maybe it's an actual pendulum. Maybe it's a grandfather clock. Maybe it's some random object tied to a string and you're holding it up and it's just waving left and right, side to side. So there's no right or wrong pendulum. You get to choose your own pendulum. What's, what's important is that it moves left and right nice and easily and effortlessly, and you don't feel like it takes any kind of work or effort to make it swing. It actually wants to swing. It's a natural movement within you that you're tuning into and connecting with right now. Maybe that feeling actually makes you want to move, right? So when the pendulum swings left with your eyes still closed, maybe your body actually swings to the left. And then the pendulum swings back through the middle to the right, and that draws your body over towards the right side of the room. So this pendulum inside your head is actually inviting your whole body to swing about 180 degrees through the room here. So I'm turning my body towards the right wall, sliding across, turning it over to the left wall. And I'm just twisting at my hips, having my torso kind of guiding the way here. My shoulders are just relaxed and facing the direction that my head is facing. So my whole body is moving as one unit, but it's a response to this mental movement inside that we connected with first. And then if you want, you can open your eyes up into the open eye version of the swing where you're letting your eyes just glide across the room. You're not trying to focus or grab onto anything. You're actually trying to let go of everything. So right when you land on one target, you immediately let it go to jump to the next target. You don't have to choose the targets. Your eyes choose the targets themselves. And even if your vision's blurry, you're, you're still just letting everything slide by in the opposite way. So as I swing to the left, the room swings to the right. And as I swing to the right, the room swings to the left. And then, if you're not seeing that, it always helps to hold up your thumb and look at your thumbnail and observe the effect that happens in the background behind your thumb. It's called oppositional movement. The computer screen is sliding in the opposite direction. It appears to be moving in the opposite direction than my thumb is moving. But ultimately, we wanna to get to the point where we don't need the thumb to see that. We can actually just let the eyes relax off into the distance and scan the room and still get the sensation of oppositional movement with this nice, slow, easy, gentle swing. And we wanna alternate between eyes open and eyes closed. So very regularly, you close your eyes and you continue the practice. You keep swinging. You can't see anything, but you can remember the objects in the room sliding by in the opposite way. This is a very relaxing image for your mind and for your visual cortex. Right? So you might be wondering, well, why am I doing this or what's happening? What's so important here? The whole visual system is getting soothed right now by the movement. Right, Not only the mind and the brain, but the eye muscles, that, that the tight eye muscles that might be preventing your eye from having flexibility and clarity are actually getting like massaged as you let them, the eyes kind of scan across the room and you swing the body here. 
And we can even activate the brain even more, turning this into a brain gym practice with a cross march. So I'm going to begin tapping my opposite knee as I swing. So when I swing my torso to the left, I lift my left leg off the ground and tap it with my hand. And when I swing my body to the right, I lift my right knee and tap it with my left hand. So right hand on the left knee, left hand on the right knee. And I'm still having this visual swing happen. So as I'm doing my cross march, I'm also noticing that the computer and the room and the objects are all still swinging in the opposite direction that I'm swinging, both with the eyes open and with the eyes closed, working the memory and the imagination and the visualization. So even though my eyes are closed and I can't see anything, I'm picturing the objects swinging around me. Maybe you just want to pick one object. If it's a little stressful or it's not working to make multiple objects appear in your mind, just choose one object in the room, like your computer, and just picture just that swinging in the opposite way. Nice. So once again, when we come out of a practice like a swing or the, the cross march, we want to check and see, okay, what effect did that have? either during the practice or immediately afterwards, maybe there's some effect that happens in your vision. And in my own experience, the long swing the practice that you and I just did together was the practice that I had my very first clear flashes during. And that was very counterintuitive to me because I used to think in order to focus and to see clearly, I had to stop moving, right? I had to stop my body, stop my head, stop my eyes, and just stare, you know, just focus. But as I'm doing this swinging and I'm moving the whole time, at the end of the swing, when I would like stop and change directions, there's that moment where your eyes land on one target and then you start going back to this other side. And when I landed on that tree or that leaf, or that, that part of the tree trunk there, it would actually pop into better focus, but I wouldn't stare at it. I would immediately leave it and go over here and get a clear flash over there. So each, I wasn't really getting clarity in the middle because I was just noticing that like everything is moving oppositely. But for that one little pause, when I transition from this direction to that direction, there would be a little more enhanced clarity there in the distance. So just want you to notice if that happens for you, whether it's in the distance, if you're nearsighted, or if you're farsighted, like we went through in the eye chart class, you can actually hold a little mini eye chart up close as you're doing your swinging. And you might notice that something about the extra movement gives you a clear flash at the near point. So the swinging is a really great practice to really start to loosen those tight eye muscles and get the eyes to start to get more clear flashes. So we just did our long swing and we added the cross marching into it to kind of combine the Bates method and brain gym. Because remember, your vision isn't happening in your eyes, it's happening in your brain, which is why we wanna not forget to do some of this brain integration and brain training stuff too. Now, the brain gym is sort of a warm up for fusion, which was the topic of last week. And so since you just did some brain gym, now we can check in with your fusion with the gate posts. So the gate posts have been coming up at several times in several classes because it's a simple but powerful practice, not only to check and see if you have fusion, but actually to develop the fusion and also get more clear flashes. So if all it takes is one finger right in front of your nose. So I have mine about one fist's distance from my nose, but you can play around with it. You can actually have it touch your nose or you can have it out a little bit farther. But I find that this distance right here is a, a really comfortable distance for me to do near and far things in between my gate posts. What I mean is to swing, right? So, well, first of all, the gate post is when you look in the distance past the finger, it's right in between your left eye and your right eye, and so it creates this optical illusion of a double image. So it looks like two fingers instead of one finger. And if you don't get the gate posts, you can always shut one eye at a time and see if you can get the finger to jump. 
Those are the two gate posts. And eventually you can get to the point where having both eyes open, you're actually seeing both of them at the same time. If you already have the gate posts, you wanna swing things between them by just pivoting your head left and right, whether it's a distant object out the window or it's a near object like your chart where you're not letting the object go beyond the gate posts. If you turn your head too much, it actually goes beyond the gate posts. We want it to be swinging in between the gate posts, not beyond the gate posts. So it's not a big swing like we were doing with the long swing. It's a little bit more of a subtle short swing. And this is kind of leading us into our eye chart section because the gate posts are a really powerful way to get your eyes to focus better on what you're looking at. And if you're nearsighted, I would want you to put your big chart on the wall in the distance or lean it up on a windowsill or against your computer or something so that you can have a greater distance between you and the chart. If you're farsighted, you're probably gonna be using the smaller charts within arm's length to be getting more clarity in the blurry zone up close. So I'm just going to lean my chart here against the screen. And I'm gonna invite you to join me for a couple little eye chart practices because the eye chart gives us a really clear indication of if we get a clear flash or not. The reason we use these charts is because it's one of the highest contrast items in the world, right? It's just black ink on a white background. So if you're doing some of these vision things outdoors or, or on things that have less contrast, it might be harder to tell when you get a, a little clear flash coming through, especially if it's a small one. But it's very, it's very indicated on an eye chart when it goes from blurry to a little less blurry because you're, you've got this high contrast. So let's see what we can achieve together in just a short little session right now um, with our eye charts. So at first, you want to just notice how it's looking at the distance you're at right now. So if you're nearsighted, you, you don't want to be so far away that, you know, the chart is, is just completely unreadable. You want to be at a distance where you can make out certainly the top couple lines, but maybe even down like halfway. So, you know, if you're a little nearsighted, you might be able to go pretty far back. But if you're fairly nearsighted, you might actually be closer. Like you might even be able to reach out and touch it or maybe it is within arm's length. So you wanna find that right distance. And if you're farsighted, you don't necessarily want it right up on your nose. You know, you might wanna have it a little more out towards arm's length where it's a little easier. But throughout this process, I want you to adjust the distance. So just check and see how your vision is looking right now so that you can notice if it changes throughout. And we're gonna start off with just a little basic um, central fixation because we had a whole class about central fixation and it being this phenomenon of seeing best where you're looking or seeing worse where you're not looking. So right away, even if the chart is not looking great, if the chart's looking blurry, when you're centralizing on the chart, which means when you're looking right at the chart with your central vision, can you actually demonstrate to yourself that other objects in the room are even blurrier than the chart itself. So even if the chart isn't clear, maybe that door over there or that printer over there or that window over there or whatever is in your space is even blurrier than that blurry eye chart. That in and of itself could begin to clear up the eye chart for you. If you're just comparing the, the more blur in the periphery to the less blur in the central, even if there is blur in the central, it actually helps you start to pick up on more of those details there. But to get even more specific with the central fixation is it's not just the eye chart as a whole and then the whole rest of the room as your periphery, but even parts of that eye chart are peripheral. So we've got these black dots on either side of the A, so when you're looking at the left black dot on the, the, the black dot on the left of the A, the black dot on the right of the A is in your right peripheral vision. And it's not as clear as the left dot is, even if that left dot isn't clear, right? So we're, we're really exaggerating some of, of the, the, the lower resolution vision in the peripheral 
field. And then when you swing over to the right black dot, now the left black dot is in your left peripheral field and it is off center and blurrier than the one you're looking right at. Maybe, maybe not. You know, if you don't have central fixation, you might actually experience it oppositely, where when you look at the left dot, the right dot actually looks better than the, than the left one. This is called eccentric fixation, or you're seeing better with your peripheral vision than your central vision. So if that's happening, you need to close your eyes and visualize the way it's supposed to be, which is that when you look at the black dot on the left of the A, the one on the right actually goes out of focus. And then when you swing over to the right black dot, that one comes into focus and the one on the left goes out of focus. So there's this, there's this ability of the brain to, to have contrast. In order for the brain to see one of those dots clearly, it has to make the other one less clear. There's got to be that contrast. It cannot all be equally clear. And so I don't want you to look at your chart with this big area of focus. I want you to start to look at smaller points like those black dots. Or if you're actually looking at the letters, you can do some of your counting corners, which is a really powerful central fixation technique, which prevents you from trying to see the whole letter as one object, and it helps you pick it apart into its different components. So th this is all a reminder of central fixation when you're playing with your eye charts in the distance or up close. And hopefully even so far, you know, you've already seen your eye chart change. That's the thing about these charts is during a chart session, it transforms. It, it becomes clearer. It becomes blurrier. It gets darker. It gets lighter. It, it, you're experiencing the fluidity of your vision, which is one of the things that we're capitalizing on with this vision training is the fact that your vision can change and it can change for the better. So let's do a little near and far shifting, which is when you go from your a uh, small eye chart in your hand to your big eye chart in the distance. Okay, so you're going to spend some time looking at the near one and remembering the central fixation. So you're just looking at one letter at a time or even one part of one letter at a time. And then what you want to do is you want to find that same letter on your distance chart, right? So they're identical charts near and far. So you're using the near one to help you with the far one if you're nearsighted. Or maybe you're using your far one to help you with your near one if you're farsighted. But either way, we're doing a lot of this adjustment from the near point to the far point. And I would encourage you to hold your near chart below your distance chart. And I would encourage you to actually exaggerate your head movements. In other words, when you're looking at the near chart, I want you to tilt your head down as if you were reading a book, right? And that's going to encourage your eyes to converge. You're going to look down and in, and it sends a signal to your brain, oh, we must be focusing up close now. And then when you look at your distance chart, I want you to lift your head up and feel your eyes diverge back out into the distance, and now you're more looking straight ahead. And now that sends a signal to the brain, oh, we must be focusing far away, right? Because it's almost like you're looking out towards the horizon, whereas when you're looking down at the near point, the brain is, you know, you can't see past the ground. And so the brain, whenever you're looking down, is so used to and conditioned to focusing near that, you know, if you just hold it up at eye level, the eyes might not get the same kind of signal as if you're helping, you're getting your other parts of your body involved to inform the eyes of where to focus. So when you're looking near, you're kind of tilting down, you're really feeling this near kind of activation. And then when you lift your head up, you feel this release of that near activation out into the far activation. And you're just letting the eyes drift out into the distance and you're coming back. And there's a lot of this back and forth adjustment, but we do not want to forget to do it mentally. So with your eyes closed, you're going to, once again, have your, your chart in your hand. You're going to tilt your head down and you remember, okay, near activation, near focus, convergence. Then you lift your head up, looking towards the horizon, out towards the eye chart, and you feel this far focus, this far activation. 
and a release out of into the distance. And so even though your eyes are closed and you can't see the charts, when you tilt your head down, I want you to feel your eyes turning in and focusing near. And when you lift your head to look in the distance, you feel your eyes let go and they diverge and now they're focusing far. So even without the visual feedback, you're still going through the motion of, okay, near focus on this letter. So I'm thinking about the letter F and that's on line three. It's the third letter on line three. And then I lift up and I think about the F in the distance, the third letter on line three, right? So I'm not just moving my head without getting my brain involved. I'm actually remembering and imagining and picturing the chart in my mind's eye. So when I tilt my head down, I'm thinking about the near chart, third letter on the third line, F, the F near. Now I lift up and I'm not thinking about the near one anymore. It's down here in my lower periphery. I can still remember it down here, but out in front of my computer screen is the full page chart, third letter on the third line, nice dark black sharp clear F, and then I'm gonna open up on it. Because historically, that was my, my weak point was the distance because I was nearsighted. So this was nice and clear to me, but that was all blurry. And so when you open up after activating your mind, I want you to open up on your weak point. So if you're nearsighted, you would open up on your far chart. If you're farsighted, you would open up on your near chart. This is because right when you open up from having your eyes closed is the best time to get a clear flash. That's when most people get the clear flashes is right that second when they open up and it might be temporary. So you get the, the improvement, but then it might fade away pretty quickly. But if you close your eyes again and just repeat the mental version of it and then open back up, there's another clear flash waiting for you. And it might be short, but we want to be feeling these moments of clarity, not just seeing them, but feeling them too, and really embodying them. Because vision is a feeling. It's, a, it's one of our senses, right? So, so we're, this eye chart little uh, review here, um, I really wanted to emphasize the role that central fixation plays so that you're just looking at one point at a time or one part of a letter at a time. And also to emphasize this distance change so that you're doing near focus, far focus. And also to emphasize the mental charts, right? Because in order to see these physical charts clearly with your eyes open, you have to see them clearly in your mind with your eyes closed. Uh, whether that's a memory, whether that's imagination, whether it's visualization, there's actually a lot of flexibility there of creative ways to make this a mental practice because not everybody's able to really visualize super clearly, but it's something that you can work on and develop. And according to Dr. Bates, that's actually one of the best and smartest strategies for enhancing your sense of sight is actually enhancing your memory and your imagination and your visualization. So speaking of which, we are going to start to wrap things up with another palming session and a little visualization together because we've done a lot of good practices together today. We did some, some uh, stretching and yawning and breathing and swinging and brain balancing and some fusion and even some eye chart practice. So your eyes really deserve a nice little rest now. So I'm going to get my palming board back and I encourage you to get into a nice, comfortable, supported position so that we can palm for a couple minutes and go through a short visualization. And I'm going to rub my hands together to build some heat before I lay my palms over my eyes. And just blocking out all the light. So it's a very gentle touch, I'm not really putting pressure on my face or my eyes. My eyes are open and they're moving around. And now they're closed. But even though the eyelids are down, my eyes are not frozen. They still have permission to shift. They still have permission to look around, kind of searching in the darkness. Or just, maybe they're just playing. Maybe they're just having fun. They're like little kids just rolling around, you know, just having fun. 
So palming is not about freezing your eyes or keeping them still. It's also not about forcing them to move, right? This is not a time to be doing eye exercises of looking far in different directions and stretching the eye muscles. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about relaxation, allowing space for these little involuntary shifts of your eyes. So you're not controlling them. You're giving them permission to be free to move. I want to do a little energy cycle visualization. And what I want you to do is think about your palms. Your palms are right on your eyes. And in the very center of each palm, I want you to imagine that there's this warmth, this light, and this energy. Maybe it's a color. So maybe a color comes to mind. It's starting to pool in your palms and it starts to kind of spiral and build some heat and light and color and energy. And it begins to make its way into your eyes. So this warm healing light first makes contact with your closed eyelids and you can feel it illuminating your eyelids, spreading across all your eyelashes. And it penetrates through to your corneas. This is the outer surface of your eye, the transparent part. This warm healing light starts to bathe the surface of your eyes. And it begins to go deeper into the tissues of your eyeballs. And right behind the cornea is your iris. This is the colored part of your eye. And so the color of the light and the energy begins to make contact with the color of your eyes. And maybe it brightens those irises up. Maybe it enhances the color or maybe it changes the color. You know, you want to just kind of see what happens. You're not trying to control this too much. You're just observing. And the opening of the iris is the pupil. So this light enters this pupil and begins to fill up your lens because right behind your pupil is your lens. And it's a biconvex structure there. It's a crystalline lens. And it's surrounded by these suspensory ligaments, these ciliary muscles. And all of those muscles relax when they get touched by this light. The lens gets purified and cleansed. If there's any kind of issues with your lenses, you're feeling the lens is kind of relaxing right now, clarifying. And then that light spreads back behind your lenses and fills the entire eyeball. It's filled with fluids. And so the entire inside of the eye is now filled with this warm, healing light. And it lands all on the retina, which is the light sensitive layer on the inside back of your eye. And so your rods and your cones are really enjoying this nice imaginary light treatment right now. They're not physically receiving light, but they're it's almost like they have muscle memory. You know, they all day long they're receiving light from the sun and from artificial lights. And so they they know what that feels like, but they're not feeling it right now, but they're remembering what that feels like to be bathed with light. And from there, that healing, energetic, colorful light gets sent back through your optic nerves, which attach to the back of each eye and go straight back into your brain. And they actually meet each other in the center of your brain at the optic chiasm. And it kind of creates this sort of X pattern in your brain. But without even getting too specific or detailed about that, you just keep feeling this energy sinking back behind your eyes, back through your optic nerves, all the way back to your visual cortex in the back of your brain. And you can imagine your entire brain just glowing with this bright, warm, healing, energetic light. And it doesn't stop there. It starts to sink down your brain stem and it starts to make its way down your spine. And it starts to spread out through every nerve in your body. 
stretching out across your shoulder blades, down your arms, down your back, down through your hips, all the way down through your legs and knees and ankles and toes to the bottom of your feet. So there's this connection you're feeling from your head to your toes. It's all connected and it's all glowing and it's all feeling good. And so if you follow that path out, you know, down the arms, you end up back where we started in the palms. And now these palms are even brighter and warmer and more colorful than at the beginning. And you can restart the cycle. You're back where you started. So you send it back through your eyelids, through your corneas, through your iris, through your lens, through the fluids, through the retina, through the optic nerves, through the brain, through the spine, back down through the entire body, ending back up at the palms. Each time you go through this cycle, it amplifies and you're feeling more and more and more deep relaxation going through not just your eyes, but through your entire body and your mind. So we're going to see if we can continue feeling connected with this colorful light as we start to transition out of palming. You want to keep your eyes closed and even through your closed eyelids, you actually start to perceive light and colors. So now it's an even more kind of tangible embodied experience with this imaginary energetic light and color that you were just thinking about. Now you're physically sensing this energetic light and color and maybe you want to do some reverse blinks or flashes or little eye pictures to transition back out nice and gently and slowly. But when you do end up back with your eyes open normally, I want you to just look around and take in the light, take in the colors, look at what you're seeing and notice, is there any change? Is your vision the same as 45 minutes ago or is it different now? after doing this really filled out holistic eye care routine. And I'm excited to finish up with a little Q and A as always, and go through your comments and see how today's class was for you. If you did notice any changes, because historically um, every, you know, there have been people in each week who have been experiencing these, these moments of clarity, which makes just, like I said, it's a little preview of what is possible with your vision when you take really good care of them, like we just did. So this does mark the end of the, the practice session. So if, if you do have to take off, I really appreciate you being here and spending this time with me today. This was a really, really good sort of overview of some of the things we've been covering over the past month and a half. Um, and like I said, if you do want to go any deeper into this stuff, we've got these two awesome opportunities coming up this weekend with the virtual vision retreat, which there's only a couple spaces left for that. Cause I do have to kind of cap it at a certain size. So it's, it's, you know, manageable and we can really get some of that interaction together. Um, and then in two weeks time, um, the first week of June is going to start the next six month vision improvement group. Uh, where we're just going to do more of what we've been doing with the Vision Tune-Up Tuesdays, except much deeper and over a period of six months. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, take a look here at some of our comments. And feel free, if, if you have anything to share, this is a good time to type it in, and we can uh, finish up today with a little Q&A. So uh, before I hopped on live, um, Nemanja said, unfortunately, I won't be able to tune up live today. However, I have a question I hope to answer. In Dr. Bates' book, in the section on central fixation, he talks about using a flashlight to help patients achieve it. I can't seem to wrap my head around this. Could you explain this further? Yeah, I did that as well. I actually read my eye chart in my room with all my lights off with a flashlight in my hand. So I would shine the flashlight so it just illuminated the eye chart, and but the rest of the room was pretty dark. 
And so what that did was it helped me focus on a smaller part of my visual field instead of this bad habit that I used to have, which is called diffusion or eccentric fixation, where I was trying to see too much at once. So without the flashlight, with the lights on normally, you know, like in this case, if I'm looking at the eye chart, what I used to do is I would try and see not only the whole eye chart clearly, but I would probably also try and see, you know, the window and the picture and, and the lamp and like, I was trying to focus on way too much at once, but if I turn all the lights off and just had a, a flashlight shining just on the chart, I wasn't trying to see the other peripheral objects as much. And I started to learn how to get that central focus back. Um, so that might clarify that a little bit for you um, to kind of play around with and experiment with. And uh, they also asked another thing I believe people would find useful is how to deal with fear uh, and rejection of change regarding vision improvement. Uh, thanks so much for your content. This helped a ton. Stay safe. Thank you. That's a great point uh, because underneath every vision problem, there usually is some sort of fear. That is one of those base, you know, underlying root causes that we can trace back, you know, with a lot of these vision problems, especially myopia. When it's blurry in the distance, there's usually some childhood fear that we can kind of connect in with why that developed in the first place. So, um, actually, um, in addition to teaching the Bates method, I also teach the rapid healing technique, which is a, an emotional clearing process developed by my vision teacher, Dr. Jerry Ann Tabor. And it's the way that we deal with the fears. It's the way that we process the fears surrounding our vision and other things in life in general. And I'm actually uh, planning on helping her uh, facilitate a, a class, a Zoom class on the rapid healing technique. We're thinking about maybe doing it on Saturday, May 23rd. Um, so if anyone is interested in learning a little bit more about the emotional connections with vision, um, it'll be that'll be a good class to attend because she is the creator of the rapid healing technique. So going straight to the source of this process. Um, so that's another one of the things I'll be adding to my website um, probably over the next week or two. Um, and uh, you can stay tuned and, and hopefully join us for that as well. Hey, Anne Marie from Santa Barbara. Glad you could, could be here today. Oh, RD has a good question. Uh, any insight into why I feel overwhelmed and anxious at the thought of being able to see clearly, even though I do want clear vision? I've worn glasses since I was nine. So that actually kind of builds off the last question about fears, right? There's this fear or anxiety around clarity. And actually, one of my students in Dubai coined this term clarity anxiety because she was getting ready to start her vision practice and she kind of expected it, you know, you know, this is going to be a long process. You know, it's going to take me a year or two to really get, you know, better vision, but she was actually getting clear flashes and improvements a lot faster than she was expecting. And it actually kind of stressed her out a little bit. And, and she said it was this clarity anxiety, like feeling like not even ready to even like have that level of clarity that you're not used to. Um, so that's a very valid kind of fear and, and overwhelmed feeling. Um, and, and, and it's kind of ironic too. Like you're like, I want the clear vision, but there's still this like weird feeling associated with it. So, you know, the rapid healing technique would be an excellent thing to apply to like, you know, address some of those fears around actually embodying the improvements. Um, but also keep in mind that the Bates method isn't like laser eye surgery. Right. If you went and got laser eye surgery, you would walk into the office and you'd walk with blurry vision. You walk out with clear vision and it's static. So you can't change it once you've had that that surgical procedure done. Um, you know, the results might fade after a while. But with the Bates method, when we get the clarity naturally, we actually have a choice of when we want to have that super sharp acuity and when we don't. Right. So. I've gotten to the point where when I need to see something really clearly in the distance, I know how to do that by applying these Bates method techniques and central fixation and shifting and relaxation and stuff. But if, if I'm in a situation where I don't need to see something super far away, then I don't, you know, I can maybe soften my gaze a little bit. You know, I, you know, I can, if you feel like you get some of that comfort from the blur, you can kind of, you know, feel that a little bit if you want to, but then you know how to sharpen it back up again. Now, 
ideally like I don't do that really often. It's not like I'm like I, I blur my vision because my visual system really prefers the clarity over the blur. But I totally know what you were saying. Like, like there was a point where I did still enjoy that kind of blur blanket that I could kind of pull over myself when that clarity that I was getting was actually a little alarming at times. Um, so it's a good it's a good problem to have, you know, to like you know be getting the clarity, but then it, it's kind of causing a little a little stress around it. Um, but, but yeah, that's a really good question. Hey, Tina, glad you could be here from Belgium. And hey, glad to see you here too, Vince. It's good seeing you yesterday. And Brian, awesome. Oh yeah, and then ASMR, are you vegan yet? Said RD, I feel the same way. Um, yeah, yeah, so it's, it's a common thing actually is to actually, like it's one, it's one, some, sometimes what I say is it's, it's one thing to take your physical glasses off, but it's another thing to take your mental glasses off, right? And so you can take the vis- you can take the physical glasses off and be doing these these vision practices and, and development and stuff. But if there's still some something holding on to the glasses, like you said, you've been wearing them since you were nine years old. So there's it's like a part of you now, right? And so there might be this internal struggle or resistance of really letting go of the mental glasses. It's just sort of an analogy there, but uh, but we need to do both. We need to address the mental stuff and the physical stuff to really get the best results from this. Uh, cool. So Jack said, uh, hey, from the last class, can I just do lazy eights on random objects all day long to get perfect eyesight? So last time we were visualizing the infinity sign or the lazy eight. So we were doing it kind of as a palming thing of like tracing this pattern. And then when we opened up, I asked you to actually trace that pattern on my face. So it's not just a mental visualization, but it's an open eye visualization as well. And um, the answer to your question is yes, you can be doing that throughout the day on random things. You can do be, be drawing, you know, lazy eights uh, on near objects, far objects, people, TVs, computers. Um, but But what I want you to really think about is not having it be this thing that you're really controlling too much. We want it to start to happen a little bit unconsciously or like involuntarily, but it does take some conscious shifting to make it become involuntary. So it is sort of like an intention. It's like, okay, I'm going to be drawing my lazy eights or my infinity signs to for the rest of the day today. But maybe there's a moment in the day where you're not consciously thinking about that, but you notice all of a sudden, oh, wow, my eyes are actually continuing to do that. That's what you're going for is we're trying to make this an involuntary kind of thing. So we do the practices and techniques voluntarily with the intention that, hey, eventually I'm not going to have to even think about this. It's going to happen completely automatically. Let's see. All right. Let's see here. So Robert put some questions in here. Um, trying to do some vision practices started again this last Thursday. Uh, I wake up, I do sunning, some exercises and palming during the day, total of 300, 400 breaths of the palming a day. I count the breaths, not the seconds. Nice. After that, I do body exercises. I have to mention that I'm not wearing glasses anymore. When I use them, I feel like I'm in another world. (laughs) Will you be leaving these live sessions on your YouTube channel so they're available to watch again? Yeah, these are all recorded and the replays are going to be up there for a little while as well. Um, first question is in how much time uh, I have to expect to have results. I see clearly after I do the exercises, but I don't think I have the really clear flashes that you say. And then question two is, is it okay uh, what I do or is it something wrong? No, that sounds really good. Um, you know, with the sunning and the palming and the breathing, um, it sounds pretty relaxing to me. Um, yeah, I mean, like, wh- hopefully the, the class we did today will also give you a little idea of what to be kind of focusing on with some of your daily routines and stuff. Um, and then the, the timeline question, that, that is a common question. Um, I, I usually break it up into temporary and permanent improvements. So maybe some of the improvements you've been experiencing so far are the temporary ones, which happen very quickly. Like some of you have, have experienced over the past five weeks, like, wow, it doesn't really take that much time to see a little momentary temporary improvement. 
But in terms of the more permanent ones, that is a little bit more long term. So that can be a number of months or even years before they they're not so uh, temporary. They actually become more long lasting. But it's very, very uh, dependent on the person and your vision and your age and lots of different factors. So I've seen the whole gamut of it, like like that student I told you about before with the clarity anxiety that, you know, getting results a lot faster than expecting. There's the other side of that, too, of like maybe getting slower results than you were expecting too. whether whether it's fast or slow, it still works. So the, the important part is that you stick with it for however long it takes. That was my mentality was whether this takes 10 days or 10 years, I am going to do this until I don't need these classes anymore. And that's the kind of dedication that we need in order to really see this through. So hopefully this series of videos has kind of helped you begin that process of getting a little more regular and a little more disciplined with your daily vision routine, just like you brush your teeth and stuff. All right, so let's see what else we got here. Making our way down. Hey, Sylvia. Glad you're here from Germany. Jack said, also, some days I'm under stress at work and just forget about everything for a day or two. Then I notice my vision has gotten worse and back to square one. Any advice? So it might feel like you're back to square one, but you're really not. So I'd never want you to think that the positive things you do for your eyes is discounted. Uh, it's not lost. Right? Any, any moment of relaxation is not wasted. And so even if you miss a couple days or even if you miss a couple weeks or even if you take a month off, it when you right when you get back into it, it's not like you have you have to start back over at the beginning. There's that muscle memory there and you pick up almost right where you left off, even if there's been a gap. I've had students where we work together, work together, work together, and then something comes up in their life where we don't see each other for months. And then we meet up again and they're like assuming that like, oh, you know that was all wasted. We're going to have to start over again. But that pretty quickly they realize, wow, right when I start doing practices again, even just a little bit, it comes right back. So, so you want to give yourself the credit for all the good stuff you've already been doing. And even if you get stressed or, or busy and you miss a couple of days, don't beat yourself up about it. Okay. You really, I actually built days off into my routine. So I didn't do this stuff seven days a week. I, you know, there were days of the week I knew I was just going to get busy. I wasn't going to get to it. And that was okay. I knew, you know, I knew I needed a little break from it to integrate and to just let it kind of simmer um, instead of me kind of forcing it, forcing it, forcing it every single day. So give yourself permission to take a breather and, and take a little time off of it and come back to it and feel like you're, you're picking right back off where you left off. Okay, Jordan chimed in too on the original question from RD. It could be due to your identification with your glasses. I know many people who are afraid to take off their glasses even when they don't need them, especially in public. So this is really touching on the, the, the fact that our glasses are not just a medical device, but they're a fashion accessory, and they actually become a part of our identity. So we actually identify as someone who is myopic or presbyopic or has a cataract or, you know, we, we actually latch onto that as like, that's who I am. And if everybody's used to seeing you with glasses on and then all of a sudden you don't have them on, like it's people are like, whoa, what's going on? And then that prompts all these questions and maybe you don't want to get into it or you don't want to explain it. And like it, it, you quickly realize how entwined all this stuff is with your identity and with relationships and with society and everything. And so what we're doing kind of goes against the grain. It's kind of against the status quo and it's not very well known or, or even embraced or accepted by the, the mainstream. And so, yeah, there, there are some tricky things along the way as we're navigating this. Um, and, and these are all good questions for you to be thinking about and applying to yourself. A mommy of two said I should get a shirt like that for my husband to wear for me. <laughs> Where did you get that? So um, yeah, these are my, uh, my company shirt. So it's got the eye chart on the, on the front and then the logo on the back. And then I've got some other ones where it's opposite. The logo's on the front and then the eye chart's on the back. Um, and there, is, there should be a link on my website uh, that where you can order shirts and T-shirts and stuff with, with this print on it. 
Um, if you go to the shop button on the tabs, um, that should be one of the first things is like some integral eyesight improvement merch. And yeah, I think it's a great way. Like you said, you can have uh, your husband wear it and then you can use, use him as your eye chart. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, hey, Aircon from Turkey. That's awesome. Glad you came. Chicken Hat Lady said, I'm getting clear flashes, but also get some intense neck pain. Went to the osteopath. Finally, thanks to COVID-19, as I change how I use my eyes, I'm affecting the nerves which are affecting my neck. So yeah, like I said in today's class, all vision problems are nervous problems. And so it's all connected in with the nervous system and the optic nerves are a big part of the nervous system. They're some of the biggest nerve bundles in the body. And so it's all really connected. So as you're working with the eyes and the brain and in this area up here, you may notice some other things happening in your neck or your shoulders or your back or your posture, you know, this connection with, with the posture and everything. So um, yeah, it's good that you're seeing an osteopath or, you know, a chiropractor or some, you don't want to, you want to complement your vision training with other modalities of healing as well to really make sure that you're hitting all the bases. So, but it's really good to hear that you're getting some clear flashes. That's, that's a great sign. Dances in the sky says, I would like to know if there's anyone here who really has achieved more than just flashes. It would be very encouraging to know someone that obtained lasting flashes in their eyesight. Uh, well, you're looking at one of them. So I wouldn't be here teaching this if I hadn't obtained this, you know, more permanent improvement in my eyesight after needing the glasses and contacts. Um, but if there's anybody else here that, you know, has had these experiences where it's more longer lasting than just flashes, feel free to chime in. Maybe some people already have and I haven't gotten to in the comments yet. Uh, but, you know, that this is, you know, what I see regularly with my private students is the people who work with me one on one are you know, sharing with me that it starts off with a little flash here and there. And then all of a sudden the flash lasts for 10 seconds or all of a sudden it's maintaining for a full minute or, you know, even up to 10 minutes of this nice clarity before it starts to kind of gradually dip back down. And then it keeps growing. You know, we get these hour long flashes, you know, the whole day begins to clear up, but it has to start with the little baby steps, you know? So, that, that's how my process was, and that's how I walk people through this as well, is start with the little temporary flashes and kind of feel what that feels like and confront that clarity anxiety a little bit that we talked about, um, and then really lean into that and, and really make it start to happen more and more and more. So we'll see as we uh, start wrapping things up and get farther down, maybe somebody else uh, has an experience they want to share. Matt Russian said, I get, I get clear flashes, then I have to drive with glasses, then start over. One step forward, then seems like one backward. I keep at it. 48 years of glasses is hard to overcome. Yes, it is. And we want to keep that in perspective as we're working on getting rid of the glasses is thinking about how long we've had them in the first place. And it's not going to take another 48 years to get out of them, but it might take longer than somebody who's only worn glasses for four years, for example, right? So we want to take that into account as, as a factor that's going to determine how long it takes to really get this, this solid improvement. Um, but like I said before, it, it might feel like a step forward and a step backward with getting a clear flash, but then having to wear the glasses to drive, for example, but it's not lost. That clear flash is deposited into your vision bank. This is a concept that I, I came up with and shared in one of my recent videos on YouTube is the vision bank. So if you haven't seen that video yet, maybe check that out. It's this concept of your every single clear flash you get is deposited in there and, and it contributes to more in your clarity account eventually. So every little clear flash counts for sure. Um, and I did the same thing. I, I still wore my glasses to drive. I wore my glasses to work. I wore my glasses to socialize but I was still getting clear flashes every day during those times when I had my glasses off and I was either doing some baits practices or I was just relaxing and noticing my vision changing. Yeah, Chicken Atlee said, I also discovered my posture change with the stress of life. So I'm now yes and relaxing more and letting my heart lead instead of my head. Let life come to me and looking too hard instead of looking too hard. Awesome, that sounds like a really nice kind of perspective shift which is, is accompanied with a vision shift, right? We can't change our vision without changing our perspective and our, our, the way we think 
about our vision and how that process works. So that sounds like a lot more receptive and allowing process versus a forcing kind of process. So that sounds like you're right on, on track with that. That's awesome. Back to work, says Matt. Thanks for stopping in while you could. Chicken Hat Lady, emotionally, I'm allowing the fear to show me where I need to relax more. Been playing a long-term game of peekaboo with the world, reminding myself now it's safe to be to see and be seen. Also a really good point because seeing clearly usually is tied in with this willingness to be seen as well. Vision is a connection, right? Vision is you connecting with that thing or person or object that you're looking at and feeling like not only you're seeing, but you're being seen as well, right? And if there's any kind of like resistance of like, well, I don't want to be seen, I want to hide, whether it's completely or partially, then then you're not, it, it can't work that way. There has to be that, that give and take, that balance between giver and receiver. Um, so that's a really good point of not just being willing to see, like uh, RD was saying about this anxiety of, of seeing out, but also this other element of actually being willing to be seen as well is very powerful. Brahmi said, is there a way to relax very tense muscles around the eyes and of the face? Um, so yeah, there is. It's a little trickier than like other muscles of the body, but um, all of the things that we've gone through in, the, in these six uh, Tuesdays over the past six weeks, I want you to try and experiment with and see if the palming and the swinging and these different relaxation practices actually start to slowly loosen up those tight eye muscles. Uh, glad you could be here, Catherine. Appreciate it. And and that's the cool thing. If, even if you can't be here the whole time live, you know, it's it's recorded. You can always catch up a little bit later. Oh, that's nice. Among all the vision recovery videos I've watched on YouTube, yours are the most helpful. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I remember when I first learned about this stuff, I was on YouTube looking for help and looking for videos. And, you know, back in 2012, 2011, like there really wasn't that much out there. And what I did find just wasn't really that helpful or really that great. And it seemed like it wasn't actually the Bates method. So right from the beginning, I really wanted to put out original Bates method content that, you know, is high quality and high value. And, and because I really think that more people just need to know that this exists. And since this isn't a very common knowledge thing, um, I just wanted to get as much out there on the topic so people could really, you know, make a decision for themselves, whether they are on board with it or not. Because without the, the true Bates method information, you can't really make an educated guess, right? There's, you can find plenty of information out on the, on the internet about how the Bates method doesn't work or it's, it's not proven, but that isn't always taking the full original Bates method into account. That's a lot of times actually talking about eye exercises, equating that with the Bates method, but I'm here to tell you that they're different. The Bates method is not eye exercises. And so it really is an understudied thing. And we really, you know, hopefully I can contribute to uh, furthering the conversation. Uh, Catherine always said, Art said, I've already seen progress. So that's awesome. Yeah, someone's asking about natural cures for eye floaters. So yeah, everything in the Bates method can also help with floaters, not just with, with blurry vision, but it can help with other issues, including the floaters too. So definitely keep up with the swinging in particular. That's a really good one for the floaters. Daniel said, you're a great man. You made me regain my sight. I couldn't see near, but far. I have no problem. Thanks again. That's awesome. Yeah. So it's, I'm glad I could help facilitate that, but I also want you to give yourself credit because it's, you know, you're the one who did it. So that's awesome. <laughs> ASMR, are you vegan yet? So this is really hard to do with a headache. I would probably agree. And I would not recommend to do these vision training things. If you have a headache or a migraine, you know, like yesterday, except for palming, maybe um, yesterday I had a session with a student who had a migraine and we actually spent almost the whole time just palming together and, and going through some Bates readings and some visualizations and stuff. So, you know, you want to be careful. You don't want to be like making your headache worse or your migraine worse, but you might find that with regular practice of some of this relaxation stuff that the headaches and migraines show up a little bit less or go away. 
And that was one of the topics of this month's Better Eyesight podcast. The second article is called My Headaches. And it's this whole long article about this doctor who used to get migraines but doesn't anymore because of the Bates method. So if you haven't listened to the Better Eyesight podcast, definitely check that out. This month's one was really good. Catherine said, there's a question I hope you could answer. I'm doing great in the day, but seems less progress in the night. Is it because of the relatively bad light condition or that I may strain my eyes? So probably both, you know, we, the more light we have, the better our sight always is. Um, but maybe you're right. Maybe there is some more strain in your eyes at night compared to the daytime. Maybe it's easier for you to feel relaxed when it's nice and sunny and, and bright. And then when there's less light, you might feel more stressed out or feel like you need to squint or strain. So I want you to think about, just observe how you're, you're using your eyes during the daytime and see if you can actually carry that over with you into the nighttime and take some of those good vision habits with you into the dark. And that flashlight question might be a good thing for you to practice with your eye chart at home. You know, maybe try doing some of your eye chart stuff in dimmer light or at nighttime. Um, not, not as a way to make you strain more, but as a way to teach you how to relax more in dim light situations. Um, but that happened to me too. My night vision lagged behind my day vision. So it's okay if you're getting a lot of improvements in the daytime, but not as much at night. That doesn't mean it's not working. You just want to stick with it and your nighttime vision will improve just like your daytime vision does. Yeah, Michelle said that let it go breathing exercise looks like Wim Hof breathing plus breath hold and palming. I love it. Going to practice it more. Yeah, so it's a combination of some yogic pranayamas. So um, yoga teaches the three-part breath where we did the two-part breath where we do the belly and then the chest. In yoga, there's three parts, the belly, the lower chest, the lower ribs, kind of where the diaphragm is, and then the upper chest. So it, it sort of was kind of combining that and the Wim Hof breathing where you take a big inhale and then you let it go and you do that 10, 20, 30, sometimes even 40 times in a row. And then you hold on the exhale for as long as you can, then take a big breath in and hold and squeeze and let that go. That's kind of the basic rhythm of the Wim Hof breathing technique, which I'm a big fan of. So I definitely wanted to kind of, you know, include it in today's class as helping you to connect this, this really powerful breathing practice with your eye healing practice by adding the palming into it simply during the breath hold. So glad you uh, like that as well. All right, so starting to make our way a little farther down here. Let's see. Sometimes it, it gets me uh, lost in the comments here. One or, one or says, when I try to notice if something in my peripheral vision is more or less blurry than something in my central vision, it seems to create mental tension for me. How can I easily put mental attention on peripheral vision without looking directly at it? Definitely take some practice. And there is this strong urge when you're thinking about something in your peripheral vision to want to look at it. But that's, you know, we're actually learning how to um, not look at peripheral things, but still notice that they're out of focus. So it's going to take some practice, but you know, my, my little mantra with the central fixation thing is that when I'm looking at something, I'm thinking in my mind, other things worse, right? So when I'm looking at the screen, all other things look worse than the screen. And then if I look out the window at the fence, now the screen is worse than the fence, not just the screen, but everything else in my peripheral field. I'm not looking at it with my central vision, but I am going over there with my mental attention, like you said, and, and I'm actually getting comfort and relaxation by pointing out that, oh, wow, that thing that I'm not looking at over there is really out of focus. That's actually relaxing because you don't have to worry about it. The mental tension comes when we actually try and see everything all at once. That really overloads and stresses the visual system out. So, But it does take some practice to kind of flip that switch in the brain. So keep playing with it. Uh, yeah, Brian asked about the alphabet chart, ABC chart. So on my website, um, integraleyesight.com slash live, where all these replays of the vision tune-ups are. Um, if you scroll down to the bottom, that's where you can download the eye chart. Um, and uh, if you can't find that, you can always just email me and I can just send it directly to you in an email. Let's see. 
Ross said, I can't seem to get the goalposts because one eye has become dominant since I developed an astigmatism five years ago. Can this be corrected with the Bates method? Yes, absolutely. So if the gate posts aren't appearing, then it, they can appear with some practice. You know, a lot of that switching one eye at a time, a little bit of that swinging, um, it might not appear immediately, but over time it really can start to, to form a little bit more. And Jack said, also, I've done the goal posts many times, but unable to get a clear flash from it. Any tips? Uh, like I said today, you can play around with the distance, whether it's touching your nose or it's farther out. Sometimes adjusting that distance will help unlock something in the eyes there. But ultimately, the main tip is to keep practicing, keep playing with it and keep swinging things in between it with relaxation. So it's not about trying to force that clear flash to come in between the gate posts. You're just enjoying that nice swing that happens, and then that relaxes you into the clear flash. Sounds like Jordan was having a good time. He said, wow, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, awesome. Maybe uh, maybe Jordan got some, some more clarity today. All right, let's see. Oh, good. I'm glad. I'm glad you enjoyed the visualization, Julie. That's one of my favorites. I, I love that one a lot where you just keep doing this like big cycle there and it just keeps like getting better and better the longer you go. <laughs> Annette asked about the, uh, the belly to chest breathing versus breathing naturally. So this is a breathing practice or a pranayama. It's a, uh, it's not really meant to be something you do like, you know, throughout the day as a regular habit, but it's just a way to like, actually oxygenate the brain and the eyes and really, you know, get these good feelings in the body there. Um, and then, you know, when you're not doing a specific breathing practice, then you just go into your normal, regular breathing naturally. Yeah. Dances in the sky also enjoyed the, uh, the visualization with the light and warmth. Nice flashes after that, but would like at this point to obtain permanent sight. I agree. That's definitely the goal. And, the more those temporary improvements come, the closer and closer you get to it just clicking in and becoming the new normal. ASMR, you vegan yet said, you should do an ASMR series of these practices. You have a very relaxing voice, and if you tag it with ASMR, you'll probably get a bigger audience. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a fan of ASMR videos, you know, some of them. Uh, I usually don't do the ones with the voices as much, but I enjoy just kind of like ambient noises and sounds in the background and stuff. But um, you know, what I, I, what that reminds me of is um, episode 28 of the Naked Eye podcast that I did. Um, I specifically spoke in a very kind of quiet, soothing, slow, calming voice um, to really induce relaxation to the listener. And people have been getting really good results from listening to that. So it's not specifically an ASMR video, but um, you might it might be kind of in that direction. But yeah, who knows? Maybe I'll do a more kind of dedicated ASMR eye exercise video or something like that. So it's a good suggestion. Nice. Rudolph got some good clear flashes after the palming session. You know, I've been working together with some one-on-one -on -one lessons. So glad you could be here too, to compliment that. All right. Making our way down. Going to be wrapping up here in a couple minutes. Tina said, came out of it feeling very relaxed and my breathing changed. That's really, that's really the goal I think we're, we're going for. So that's a good sign. Madeline said this was helpful, but not noticing any flash. So that's one of the challenges here with this work is there's times where we put the practices in and we get noticeable improvements. And then there's other times where we, we go through a whole practice and there's no change. It, it's not clearer, which might immediately make you think, well, that didn't work or that didn't do anything, but it did. Because remember, your vision is not just your eyesight. Eyesight is one component of our vision. And obviously, it's one that we're working on strengthening and improving. But I want you to really expand your definition of vision to include other things than just your eyesight. Other things with your vision, maybe your depth perception, your color perception, your, the, the way your eyes feel. So beyond just visual acuity, maybe you're noticing other changes in your eyesight or your vision. But even beyond your eyes, these practices are not just for the eyes. They're for the brain. They're for the body. They're for your mind. They're for your life, right? So it's I want you to 
not just pin all of the results on the visual acuity as an indication that you're getting the benefits, but notice how there's this internal shift. Like Tina said, like, you know, I noticed my breathing changed and I felt more relaxed. And that's the, the groundwork. That's the foundation for getting better visual acuity down the line. So that can be a little confusing to people because they're like, oh, well, I did it. I tried it and it didn't work. But that's just because they were just looking for that visual acuity thing at first. And sometimes that comes later down the line. So I do encourage you to keep you know regular with this practice and stay dedicated to it, regardless of the changes that you're seeing immediately, because you know that they are contributing to better clarity next week and next month and next year. So we got to have that long term vision, not just the physical distance vision, but the mental vision of the future of where this practice is taking us. Shakarina said that that was a really positive visualization. Yeah. Like I said, it's one of my favorites. Oh, nice. Michelle said, I can't believe this palming result. What an amazing clear flash. And after that higher definition in general, I love guided palming. It's always led me to better eyesight. Thanks. Awesome. That's really, really good to hear. I mean, it's like, and that sounds like it's not just a, a momentary clear flash, but just a little bit more higher definition just in general, right? So it's not just this temporary spike in your clarity, but like your overall baseline is slowly kind of rising up a little better, better, better over time. So I want you to keep track of that, not just these momentary fluctuations, but your general baseline vision improving as well, which sometimes takes longer. Hey, mom, once again. Awesome. Thanks. So glad you're here. Let's see. Christian said, I found that palming is too taxing for me, as in I dread doing it, so I don't do it. So instead, I walk outside or simply close my eyes while laying down or sitting back. It's relaxing. Yeah. So, you know, Dr. Bates talked about the fact that even just closing the eyes can sometimes be as relaxing as palming the eyes. Um, and, you know, it's good for you to be figuring out, oh, well, I don't really enjoy that one very much. So I'm going to focus on these ones instead, which I do enjoy. That's perfect. You don't want to be forcing yourself to do things that aren't feeling good for you. You want to customize this for you. Igor asked, hey, Nathan, have you ever used the car headlight sunning technique to obtain a bit sharper vision before driving a car late in the evening? Yes, I have. Um, so that's referring to a lot of people complain about driving at night. One of the issues is the oncoming headlights. It's like, whoa, that's super bright. It kind of makes it harder to see the, uh, the road where you're driving. And so what Igor is mentioning here is you use the headlights as the sun, like in the sunning practice where you have your eyes closed and you're letting the sun shine on your eyelids. You know, before you start, you don't want to do that while you're driving. You want to, you want to do it before you start driving. But you know, maybe using your own headlights or some other, you know, oncoming headlights, you know, in the other lane or whatever to get that light stimulation to prepare you for that driving. Um, and, you know, sometimes even when I am driving, I'll actually look briefly into the headlights. Now, normally you would think that that would be the opposite thing you would want to do because it would kind of like, you know, give you a temporary like, you know, light spot or something. But in my experience, you know, I'm not staring at it. I just glimpse at it real quick. And when I come back, it actually helps maintain some more of that, that clarity on the road as well. Um, but, you know, you just want to do what's comfortable. Um, and obviously when you're, the whole driving component is tricky because we want, obviously want to be smart and safe about this stuff. Um, so any kind of car practices is always advised to start as a passenger. So somebody else is driving so that you can take your glasses off and you can practice some of these things on the road. Um, and then in terms of doing this stuff on your own, it's really once you've gotten a lot more improvements where you can experiment with that stuff while driving. Hello from Sweden. Hey, welcome. Hey, Fulvia, glad you're here. And Ray, awesome to have you again. It's awesome chatting with you on the phone last week. Okay, so Christian says, I can vouch for clear flashes. The first time I only saw a clear flash for a second, then one day I had a clear flash for about 20 seconds, which is a fond memory. Now I can clear flash on command. Wow. So that's I think that's a response to uh, one of the previous questions of, of somebody asking, you know, hey, is anybody else here like experiencing them actually lasting more than just a second? So appreciate you sharing your experience with that. And that was the 
that was what I was saying. That was my progression. It started really small. Then they lasted 10 or 20 seconds and then a couple minutes. And then it got to the point where you actually can make it happen. Like, like he says on command, you know, it's like, it's not a forced kind of thing, but you have the tools within to actually tap into that clarity in that moment. So I think that's really what we're all learning here. Rob said, wow, there are uh, people who have had the Bates method work for them. I've never even met one in online, forget real life. There are a lot of people out there who have gotten uh, benefits from the Bates method and even full recovery with the Bates method. Um, you know, I'm involved in these vision organizations where we have conferences where teachers from all around the world, Europe, South America, Asia, North America, it's like there are people all around the world who not only teach this stuff, but help other people get results. And you're right. Sometimes it's hard to find these people and, and these case histories, but they are out there. And it's been really cool to kind of build this community with these YouTube live streams of having people come together and share their experiences and, and actually meet each other. Cause that's what this is about. We got to support each other because we have the, you know, conventional approach kind of against us, you know, like they're, they're not really rooting for us, but, um, but we can really lift each other up in the, in these uh, forums. So, so I'm glad that you finally met, met uh, a group of people who are, are getting benefits from this stuff. All right. So, Coming to the end here, just over an hour and a half. You know, originally I, I was planning on these things being pretty short, but like I said, I've, I've just been really enjoying being able to answer everybody's questions. And all right. Is it good if I do the methods while closing one eye for far and near sight seeing? Uh, yeah, so you can always do these practices with one eye at a time, whether it's, you know, palming one eye and you're doing some of that near and far shifting, or maybe you have an eye patch, you can wear an eye patch during um, to kind of have a hands free way to, to block one eye at a time. It's a really good way to be isolating one eye and then working them together again. ASMR you vegan yet said, do you think that anxiety clarity is similar to phantom fat? Allow me to explain, people who have lost weight sometimes don't realize it. I lost 46 pounds and didn't know it until I bought clothes. It's like the brain holds on to an image of ourself, of yourself as an overweight person. Could anxiety clarity be like this? Yeah, I think, I think uh, it, it could be connected in that way of, of our self-image. You know, it's how we view ourselves and how sometimes that doesn't always match how we actually look. Um, and that can include our glasses or our vision as well. So once again, it just really points to the fact of how mental our vision really is and how it's so intricately tied in with our, our mind and our thoughts and feelings and stuff. UN said, I've been doing the practices from the online holistic vision program for the last month and I've been getting longer flashes for hours, especially after a good night's sleep or after a long workout. That's awesome. That's really good to hear. So that, that's my six week online program that I created and um, it's a little bit more of a self-directed uh, process where like UN's doing, you kind of go through the, the videos on your own and, and they've been working on it for a month and already getting, you know, some really good results from it. So that's awesome. That, that's a different one than the uh, six month group I'm starting next month, but the, it's also a great option for if you want to do some of this, like kind of more of a self-study thing without as much one-on-one -on -one coaching from me, but you can always add private lessons on top of the holistic vision program too. So. So yeah, I'm glad you're enjoying it, UN, and I'm glad you're here with me today too. All right, RD uh, is coming back to say, hi, Nathan, I wonder why my right eye lid doesn't want to close when I close my eyes. It flutters and tremors. Is it the same muscles as the eyeballs are different? Yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. Sometimes like with the gate posts, when, I, when I'm like, hey, you know, close one eye at a time and switch, some people don't have the ability to, to close one eye and keep the other one open. They have to use their finger to, to hold the lid down or... Uh, like you said, sometimes when you just want to close your eyes, the, one of the lids might twitch or kind of flutter or something. Uh, it's not the same muscles as the um, six extraocular muscles. There's a seventh muscle that controls the eyelid that's above the other six, um, but it is right there next to it. So my assumption is that when we have this chronic tension kind of showing up in the extraocular muscles, that can also show up in our eyelid muscle, the blinking muscle. And then it throws off our relaxed blinking habit. And then that interferes with the vision even more. So, um, yeah, I would, you know, 
when you do your palming, it's not just those six muscles that attach to the eyeball. You want to also be thinking about the eyelid and the blinking muscle relaxing too. So you might want to pull up an anatomical diagram of that, that blinking muscle just to kind of see where it is and how it works. Um, but that, you know, we want to get that one relaxed just like the other ones too. Yeah, Tino saying I would like to attend your rapid healing technique class. Um, is it already sure you're organizing on May 23rd? So that's that's the date that we have tentatively agreed on. Um, but I need to email Dr. Tabor back today to kind of uh, hammer that down. So before you um, you know get that set in stone, just just hold hold on, and then I'll add it to my website. So I would say to keep checking back uh, my main website. I'll add it right to the side page there um, with a link where you can. Uh, get access to that class. Um, and if you're on my email list, I'll probably send out uh, an email invitation for that as well. Christopher said the first flashes were a shock, then more frequent, then controllable. Is everything at the same distance is in focus, even the smallest letters. Thanks for the six sessions. Unforgettable, encouraging. Hey, I'm really glad you've been participating and I'm really, uh, it's been really awesome to kind of get to know you a little bit more in our WhatsApp group with the other vision teachers. It's uh, you know, it's really cool to see you representing the, the Bates method in South Africa. And maybe one day after the, uh, after the pandemic, uh, I might make it down there. That's one of the contents I've never been to before. So thanks for being here, Christopher. And thanks for sharing your experience with the clear flashes too, because we, we need to keep hearing more and more people's experiences of how it starts small and it might be a, a shock. It might be an anxiety at first. And then it becomes frequent. It becomes more controllable. We start to relax in the presence of the clarity. And then that becomes our new vision. Sam asks, is it normal to have a, some kind of sensation feeling inside the eye when ciliary muscle and lenses relax, causing clear flashes? Yes. When, when I first started this process, my eyes were essentially numb. I couldn't feel them. I couldn't sense the, the changes that were happening. But when I started taking my glasses off and started doing these vision practices, I got to the point where I could start to feel my lens changing shape. I could feel the ciliary muscles engaging and relaxing. I could feel my extraocular muscles doing their jobs more so than before. So I would, that's why earlier today I said vision isn't just a, a sensation, it's a feeling too. So we want to be really feeling what is going on in this process. And it might feel different for different people, but I do encourage you to kind of keep tapping into that and leaning into that and seeing what that feels like. Mohammed said, hi, can you say my name? Sure. Thanks for being here, Mohammed. Appreciate you uh, joining. Uh, let's see. Hi from Puerto Rico. I just love, I love seeing where people are watching from. It's so cool. Ida says, hi, I like the way you teach us. Thanks. I like the way that you come and hang out and, uh, and join for these fun sessions. All right, cool. I'm glad you're, you're enjoying the, the Q&A session time, Julie. It's, like I said, you know, it's, I don't know, maybe it's part of my perfectionism where I, I don't want to leave any questions unanswered, you know, like, uh, I just want to make sure everybody's clear on how this stuff works. All right. And that brings us down to the end here. So I really, really, really appreciate you for being here and joining me in these sessions and experiencing it with me and asking these great questions. And we're going to keep having opportunities to build this community, um, whether it's in the form of, you know, these retreats or courses or just, you know, on the YouTube page, you know, I'm still going to be making new videos and releasing more podcasts and doing more classes and everything. So there's always going to be lots of opportunities for you to keep learning about this stuff because it's an ongoing journey. Uh, but until then, just kind of keep an eye out for some new upcoming events. Um, if you're feeling called to join the group this weekend, just reach out and let me know. It's not too late to sign up. There's still a few spaces left. Um, or if you're thinking that the six month program would be a little better for your schedule or just with your learning style, uh, we can get you set up with that as well. But otherwise, I hope you have a really relaxing rest of your day. Hopefully you enjoyed today's class. I know that I did, and I'm sure I'll be seeing you again soon. Thank you.